Thank you for the opportunity that I may present my work here today. My name is Sjoerd Groeskamp and I work at the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research that is located on the island of Texel and located in Eerstuke. And the island of Texel, where we are right now, is also the place where I was born and raised. And to protect Texel, the Netherlands and 15 other countries from sea level rise, me and Joachim Kjelsen came up with a solution to enclose the North Sea from the Atlantic by building gigantic dikes. Now, even though we do not want this dam, this enclosure to be built, we proposed it as a warning for what might come if we do not mitigate climate change. The reason for this is because we are in a crisis, a climate crisis. This climate crisis can have an enormous impact on our society. And to avoid, we have to avoid this at all costs, because otherwise it might cost us everything. And to be able to do that, we have to mobilize people all around the world and inform them about the problems of this crisis and especially the urgency with which we have to avoid this crisis from really happening. And to do that, one very helpful way is the use of images. People are particularly moved by images. The right image offered at the right time can have effects far greater than those imagined by the ones creating it. Let's look at some examples. The blue marble. This was one of the first images of Earth from space. That meant that this was one of the first times that we saw the Earth from space, which was very beautiful, and it instigated environmental movements to preserve this planet. It has been very important, and these environmental movements are still here. Another great example are the pillars of creation, where stars are created. The way these images fascinates us, we just want to know more about what's out there. And this has done more for astronomy and astronomy science than a thousand conferences could do. Another very beautiful example are the warming stripes by Ed Hawkins. These stripes particularly show how fast the climate is warming and has communicated this message to a lot of people. And finally, more in my expertise, oceanography. We can see the global ocean circulation. This was one of the first pictures where we saw that there is such a thing as a global ocean circulation where all ocean basins are connected and that this circulation could stop and that it could affect the climate. This inspired a lot of research directions and a lot of people that are interested in the ocean. And then there is need, although not at the same heights as the previous example, but it was our attempt to convey the complicated message of climate change into one image. Because what this is actually saying is, if we do not do something about climate change now, we might have to build these dams. But how else do you communicate something like this? Because I ask you, do you know what it means if the world warms two or four degrees? Do you really understand the difference between two or four meter sea level rise for society or 400 or 800 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere? It is really hard to translate these numbers into something else than more numbers. And therefore, images can be very powerful to communicate this message. Half Nederland onder water. En om dit rampscenario te voorkomen, bedacht oceanograaf Sjoerd Goeskamp een megalomaan plan. De hele EU beschermt door één Noordzeedijk. En inmiddels gaat zijn plan de wereld over. It's one of the craziest ideas for protecting our east coast from flooding. There is a scientist across the sea there in the Netherlands who has come up with a cunning plan. Een dijk die de volledige Noordzee afsluit, dat is het plan van hoe kan het ook anders? Een aantal Nederlanders. I'm Dutch. Of course I think this works. <laughs> een dijk van meer dan 600 kilometer van Frankrijk tot Noorwegen. Huge dams, you can see them on the map there north and south. Een gigantisch project. Effectively turning the North Sea into a lake. The enclosure would run 300 miles from Scotland to Norway and from southwest England to northern France. Well, this is what we do all the time. All right, so we could see that the image of need created some discussion. And I believe that it would only work if you create an image which is somewhat realistic.
And I'm pretty sure that some of you are still doubting if need is realistic. And that's okay. Um, so what I would like to do now is to go through the arguments that led us to propose this solution and after that talk about some of the technical details that convinced us that this could really be built. Let's start with this figure right here. Let's go there for a second. This is the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere over the last almost million years. And we can see a lot of variation in there. But in total, it's a variation of only about 100 parts per million. Now, if we look at the temperature, we can see that when the CO2 goes up, so does the temperature. When the CO2 goes down, so does the temperature. In other words, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and the temperature are following each other. Even though we only saw a hundred parts per million change in the CO2 concentration of the atmosphere, we could see a 12 degree change in the temperatures. Something similar is observed when we look at the sea level. So again, here in red is the line representing the CO2 concentration over the last half a million years. In blue, it is the line representing the sea level of the last half a million years. And again, we see that the sea level is more or less following the CO2 concentrations. And that is worrisome. And the reason why that is worrisome is because of this. With only 100 parts per million CO2, the natural variation over the last million years, we saw sea level changes of about 120 meters. This has consequences, of course, because we are actually putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. How much are we putting in the atmosphere? We can see here. I had to really shrink the bar uh, showing this variation of the last 800,000 years to be able to show you how much CO2 we're adding to the atmosphere. First of all, we started at 280 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution, which was already quite high considering the last million years. We are currently at about 420 parts per million. Uh, that is also the most optimistic scenario of the IPCC to where we think we will more or less end up in 2100. Other scenarios um, like RCP 4.5 and 6.5 will end up somewhere around 600 parts per million. And these are the scenarios that at current level seem to be where we are going for 2100. And luckily for us, it is now more unlikely that in terms of CO2 concentration, we will end up with the highest scenarios, which could be up to a thousand parts per million. But adding so much CO2 to the atmosphere in such a short time begs the question, what will temperature do and what will sea level do? We can calculate that a little bit and have some indications. For example, we know from previous work that for every degree global warming, we will have about 2.3 meters sea level rise. Now, if we look at the predictions for the temperature uh, global warming in 2100, at this moment ranges somewhere between two and four degrees. But that's not where it ends. Because if we look at the climate sensitivity, which means if we double the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, what will the temperature do? We know it will increase by about three degrees. If we then take the range of possibilities of where we might go with our CO2 concentrations, this would mean that we would in total warm the Earth by about 4 to 12 degrees. If we take that range and multiply it by the 2.3 uh, meter sea level rise per degree Celsius warming, we could get a sea level rise of 5 to 27 meters. Another study showed something else. This showed a historical evidence of past climates and sea level um, that for current CO2 concentrations, we have about 68% chance to get nine meter sea level rise. And of course, this could be a bit lower, it could be much higher, and the CO2 concentrations will change. They won't stay at our current levels. To conclude, this means that over the, the millennia to come, we will likely get something between five meters and 25 meters global sea level rise. But the big question is, how fast will this happen? There are two uncertainties in predicting this, two main uncertainties. 
One main uncertainty is, of course, what emissions will we have in the future? And the other main uncertainty is how good are our climate models that predict the sea level rise? And if you take those uncertainties together, uh, it turns out to be quite difficult to predict how fast and when sea level rise uh, is happening. The most optimistic scenario, and I have to say that this is quite outdated and does not include um, the effects of ice sheets well enough. Um, this is from the IPCC and this takes uh, a very limited CO2 rise in the atmosphere and it tells us that we will probably get at least one meter sea level rise in the next centuries. That's not too bad, we can deal with that. However, the worst case scenarios tell us that if you include uh, new physics about the instability of ice sheets and you work with the high-end scenarios of CO2, you could get up to 13 meters in the next 400 years, which would be about over three meters per century. Now, luckily for us, this seems to be an overestimate, but unfortunately not as much of an overestimate as we would like. So, all of that together provide us with arguments why we propose to build the Northern European Enclosure Dam. First of all, it is the predictions of sea level rise, which we've seen will be at least a meter, but could be well above 20 meters if we're unlucky. The question is how fast will it happen? And even uh, expert judgments say that it might be two to four meters in 2300, which would already be very difficult to deal with, not trivial at all. Because one of the questions is, can we limit climate change? We don't know how much carbon we're gonna uh, put in the, in the atmosphere in the future and how that will affect our climate. As I said, there are big uncertainties in this. And we just don't know which scenario we will end up because this depends on all kinds of political and uh, movements. And some of these scenarios could, you know, they could um, force a tipping point. Once such a tipping point is reached, it cannot be reversed and we will get sea level rise no matter what. Some people say we have reached some of these tipping points, other people say we don't. We don't really know for sure. So it could be happening already. Then it is the high risk of the worst case scenario. So what happens if we get into the worst case scenario? The results are super damaging. It's so bad that it would have been worth preparing for this when looking back. So instead of being in that position, you want to look forward now and be sure that you're prepared for the worst case scenario in case it would happen because of the damage it could do. And finally, it is the implementation time because it takes a long time to do adaptation and mitigation efforts. Even the Delta worker took about 40 years to build. A lot of, if you want to move whole cities, for example, to save them from sea level rise, this will take hundreds of years, perhaps. So you have to be on time. And all of that together led us to propose need. Besides, it turns out that I'm not that crazy, because even Johan van Veen, the guy who invented the Delta Werke, he already mentioned somewhere in his, well, not in his book, but in the hallways, it is in his biography, that we might end up building dams between England and France and Scotland and Norway, which is exactly what we proposed. Besides, what are the alternatives? What alternatives do we have? Well, we could give up, of course, but even if we just look at it from an economical point of view, we already know that giving up is five to 10 times more expensive than trying to save what we have. Another form of giving up in some way is managed migration, and this could be a real solution. This basically means that if we start now moving large cities and infrastructure to higher places, we could, be, we could have been moved on time to avoid a disaster. But you have to start now, because otherwise it will be a disaster, because you have to do it on a very short time scale. And the fact is that a lot of politicians and people don't want to move, and therefore politicians are not very eager to do this. Um, so the question is, if, even though this could be a real solution, if this will become a real solution. And our personal opinion was that it would be very hard to make this a real solution. And then you're basically left with protection. And if you think about protection, then 
you get to need. Because if you want to protect the Netherlands against a lot of sea level rise, and we're talking two, three, four or more meters, then you would have to build huge dikes all around the Netherlands. But then what happens when Germany is not working with you or Belgium is not working with you? You would also have to build dikes along your borders. In other words, you have to you will have to work together with the countries next to you, and they have to work together with their neighboring countries, etc., etc. So why not all work together at once and just do it once and for all and do it good? And that's how we came up with this idea of need. Because when you do it this way, you protect about 25 million people from sea level rise in 15 different countries, which can all share the costs. So, Let's think about this for a moment, because it would be huge. If this would be built, you would see it from space. Just think about it. The offside dike, or I'm going to call it the South Korean seawall, they're the, the, the longest enclosures we have, and they're about 33 kilometers. Well, need would be about 630 kilometers. It's 20 times as long, but in volume, it would be about 100 times as big. So that's huge. And if we take that volume, we can also start estimating what it would cost. Because what would it cost to build such an enormous structure? Well, if we look at the South Korean seawall, and we use the volume of the seawall and how much it costs, including the infrastructure, and multiply it by the volume of need, then we have an estimate of about 192 billion euros. If we do the same for mass flux 2 with all its infrastructure, or if we look at um, uh, the cost of dams in general and we extrapolate it, we get estimates of about 500 to 300 billion euros to build need. On top of that, you have to build pumps to pump water out of the basin, and I'll come back to that later, but it would add some money to the, to the cost as well. And in total, you will end up with something like 250 to 550 billion euros. And that is a lot of money. But actually, it is not as much as it sounds. Even for the five main countries uh, that would be defended by this, the UK, Netherlands, Germany, Belgium, and Denmark, it would only be about 0.2% of their GDP. If you spread it out over all the countries, it would be even much cheaper. Besides, it turns out that protecting the Netherlands up to one and a half meter sea level rise in 2100, um, to be able to do that, integrated the cost of the next 80 years would be about one third of the cost of building need. Of course, these are back of the envelope uh, calculations, so that means they're very rough estimates. But considering the fact that we're talking about uh, much longer than the next 80 years, a lot more countries and perhaps a total of much more sea level rise, we really think that financially need can easily be built. But can it be, can it be built? Technically, that is a good question. Because what we see here is um, the depth of the basin where we think need should be built. And we can see up here that most of it is about 100 to 50 meters deep. That is not so much a problem. The South Korean seawall was already built of over 50 meters deep. So we can definitely do that. The hardest challenge would be here, near Norwegen, in Bergen, where it can be up to 320 meters deep. Now, we have not built dams that deep yet. But what we have done is built structures like oil rigs and mounted them onto the bottom that is over 500 meters depth. Now a dam is of course not an oil rig, but it does help us because it could give us some motivation that this can be done. Besides, so far there's not been a single engineer who have claimed that this is not possible to be built, and by now I've seen and spoken a lot of them. The other thing we have to take into account is the fact that the rivers will still discharge water into the basin, which means that they're pumping fresh water into the basin that we have to pump out. Because if we don't do that, uh, we will get one meter sea level rise per year inside the basin, which would of course make it very <laughs> not very useful to build a dam around it if you're drowning yourself. And that's because it's about 40,000 cubic meters per second that we have to pump out. And actually, that means that we need about 100 pumps of of the ones that are now built in the offside dike. 
and that's doable and it's already in the cost. The other thing to take into account is the shipping industry, because some of the biggest harbors in the world like Rotterdam, Antwerpen, Bremerhaven and others are all within the enclosure and a lot of goods are entering Europe through those harbors. So we have to come up with a solution for that. And one solution would be to build harbors on the other side of the dike, of the enclosure, and from there ship, uh, put the goods on ships that operate within the basin or on trains that run along the dike. Of course, we could also build giant sluices. Um, this seems like a lot, and it is a lot, but we shouldn't forget that if we wouldn't build the enclosure, which I hope we don't have to, but if there's a lot of sea level rise and we wouldn't build the enclosure, all those harbors, they also have to continuously adapt to that sea level rise, which would also cost a lot and will also break up the infrastructure. So the alternatives are not necessarily much better. Then it is the use um, material to build the dike. Uh, we would need things like clay, sand, concrete, all those kind of materials. But if we just take sand for a moment, what it means is that we need as much sand to build just this enclosure as we use in the whole world in one year for all the construction there is. So that is a lot of sand. And on top of that, sand is getting scarce. So that's a problem. But again, if we face so much sea level rise, what are the alternatives? If we are going to move whole cities to higher grounds, or if we're going to build dikes all along the coasts, we would also need a lot of material and sand. So this is a general problem we have to deal with, not specific for this uh, idea. Something a lot of people also ask me is the threat of terrorism. What if somebody wants to blow up the dam? Well, of course, that would be very unfortunate. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily be less safe than what we currently have because most of our protection now is from dikes. If you blow up a dike, um, cities are very often just behind the dikes, like on this example, which means if you blow up the dike, the cities behind it will flood in a matter of minutes to hours. On the other hand, when you would blow up need, you would have to fill this entire North Sea Basin and the Baltic Sea before you will start to feel the effects of sea level rise, which means it will give you weeks to months before you would uh, threaten the coastal cities. And because of that, you might argue that perhaps that is a safer solution when it comes to trying to blow up the construction. But building something like NEED would of course have huge environmental impacts. To start with, just think about the circulation. Here in this figure, you can see the left, which is the current situation, where you can see the orange lines with numbers that represent some kind of circulation going on now. And the blue basically tells you um, the height that the sea surface goes um, every once, every 20 years, because of storm and tides and all combined. If you then build this construction, then on the right, what you see is the effect with need. So basically, you kill all the tides in the North Sea, the circulation will completely change, and um, this will have massive impacts on the environment. On top of that, we still have the rivers pumping fresh water into the basin while we're pumping the salt water out of the basin. This will happen in about 50 to 100 years where the basin will become fresh. And of course, all those things together will completely change the ecosystem or perhaps the ecosystem will completely collapse and replace with something else. And if that is something we want, it's up for debate, but I think most people would not like this idea. Still, there are reasons why people would like this over alternative solutions, because we know that people do not like to be moved. If you have to move whole cities, that means you have to move uh, people that have been in places for generations. And it would also mean loss of a lot of cultural heritage, and you would need politicians uh, that instigate this change. And because people don't want to move, this might be unlikely. But with need, you would place the dam mostly in the water. So this minimizes the displacement and loss of property. But still, is it likely that it would be built? Because it would require a collaborative and proactive approach 
that spans across political parties, countries, and generations, because it would take a while before it would be built. And it's questionable if we are capable of doing such a thing. And besides, it's, it would partly be built in international waters, and I'm not sure what the rules are about that. To say something about politics, once this was on the internet, a lot of jokes were made, of course, uh, but I particularly like this one, that question if we should include or maybe exclude the UK, because the dam could either undo Brexit or we could take Brexit into account and just extend the dam to go around. Finally, I would like to say something about need um, as a halfway solution, because one of the things about need is, can you build this all at once? When do you make that decision? Oh, we're just going to enclose it. Now, there were some professors from uh, Delft University who came up with the idea to first build half of it. So let's look at these figures. Here, on the left, we see the current situation. That is how it is now. Then the next figure is need as we proposed it in our paper. But then here we see some alternative configurations with and without the part in the south. And what those would do, of course, it wouldn't protect us against sea level rise, but what it can do, it can dampen the tidal amplitude and it can dampen the storm surge. And as a consequence of that, you can have a little bit of sea level rise to still have the same protection from your dikes. And this way, you could start building half of need in the hope that we manage to mitigate climate change and we don't need to build the rest. But if all fails, we could still decide to also construct the rest. And while building half of it, you won't have all the problems with the ecosystems. So to conclude, if we think about the Northern European enclosure dam, can it be done? Yes, it should be possible. But should we now sit back and relax? No, we should not. Because the Northern European enclosure dam is treatment of the symptoms. It is not getting rid of the disease. Because if you want to get rid of the symptoms, you have to treat the disease. And in this case, the disease is climate change. So the only way to avoid to build a solution like need is to mitigate climate change. Because on top of sea level rise, climate change has much more symptoms. Think of bushfires or food shortages or uh, climate refugees that lead to wars and political instabilities and many, many, many more things. So by just building dams, we're just treating one of the symptoms. Whereas we could also try and avoid climate change and it would be much easier. But it is a big task at hand and it will be very difficult to realize. Um, what you and I as an individual could probably do easiest well, one of the easiest things we can do is eat less meat or vote for the right politicians. And then the ball is also with the politicians. They have to act on time and treat this climate crisis as the emergency it is and do something right now and implement perhaps unpopular policies right now. But that is what we need. The other thing you can do as an individual is perhaps not just your science, which is good, and we need a lot more science, but perhaps it is also time for action. And for that, there are organizations like Climate Cleanup that are trying to fund and help start up um, initiatives that try to draw down carbon from the atmosphere into the earth. And this is somewhere between climate uh, science and activism. And we could be part of that too and help with our expertise. So, to conclude, most importantly, the Northern European Enclosure Dam, for now, is a warning. But we have to act now to avoid solutions of these kind of proportions. So if we fail to limit climate change, the warning might become the solution. <laughs>